This is acting lecture number two. Today we're going to talk about dramatic structure. Now, I know this is not a dramatic structure class, but it's important for an actor to understand how a play is structured. It will help you play your character. My notes today are going to come from a book um, called Pointers on Playwriting. It's by a lady named Josefina Nigley. I took a class on dramatic structure from Josefina Nigley. Uh, she, for many years, was a writer in Hollywood. She wrote a lot of westerns. And her book, Pointers on Playwriting, is one of the easiest I've come across to understand how a play or a film is structured. Stanislavski, the great acting teacher, Konstantin Stanislavski, you're going to hear a lot more about him as we go along through the semester, had a term which he called super objective. The super objective is the main idea of a play. This is very important. Whenever you work on a play, try to figure out what is this play about? What is the message I should get when I read or see this production? Figuring out the super objective is one of the first things you should do after you read a play when you're getting ready to perform in it. It's important to have discussions with your director about the super objective because every decision your character makes in a play ties back to that super objective. The play that I'm going to talk a lot about as an example of super objective is Shakespeare's play, the Scottish play, Macbeth. Now, when I was talking about superstitions, I didn't mention Macbeth, but it's a, it's a biggie. Actors do not say the name Macbeth on stage. Instead, they call it the Scottish play. And they do so because they believe saying the name Macbeth on stage or backstage will br bring bad luck to a production. This goes back in theater history. It is thought that, uh, well, some people believe that because Shakespeare had witches in the play and in some of his writing he used actual witches incantations, that it brought bad luck to the play, and it's followed it ever since. And there are all kinds of stories of, of bad things happening during productions of the Scottish play. But uh, we're going to use Macbeth as an example. When Shakespeare wrote the play Macbeth, as all good playwrights, he wanted to please his audience, but he especially wanted to please the person who helped him and made sure he got paid. And that was, uh, at first, Queen Elizabeth and later King James. And Queen Elizabeth did not like anyone who did not believe that she had uh, been given the power to rule from God. Uh, it was her right and the right of kings. And if you go back and look at a lot of Shakespeare's plays, uh, that theme comes up a lot. It's in Julius Caesar, and it's in Macbeth. What I believe the super objective of the play Macbeth is, that misguided ambition will lead to destruction. Uh, Macbeth is a loved king, uh, is loved by the king. He is a general. Uh, he's an honorable man. Everyone loves him. And yet, when he is not made next in line to be king, he plots to murder the king. He does that early in the play. And then he continues to fight for power. And it is this misguided ambition that will lead to his destruction, because in the end, he will be destroyed. So when I do the play Macbeth, or work on the play Macbeth, I use that as my guide. Uh, misguided ambition 
leads to destruction. That's the super objective of the play. Now, all plays begin with exposition. Exposition is information that we need to understand what is going on in the play. Any film that you see, any play that you go to, all begin with exposition. Uh, in a movie, there may be a car chase at the beginning of the film, but you'll discover the car chase is to give us information that we'll need later. And that's what exposition is. There are two types of exposition I want you to know. The first type of exposition is called block exposition. Block exposition is where we get what we need to know in one large chunk, one big block. It could be uh, a monologue, uh, or soliloquy in Shakespeare, whatever it might be. We're getting a lot of information and we're getting it immediately. The ancient Greeks did this uh, with the use of the chorus. Uh, the chorus would come out of the beginning of a tragedy and they would tell us the story. Uh, they would give us all the background information. Oh, woe is Thebes. Thebes is being attacked by a monster. Oh, things have gone wrong in Thebes ever since our king disappeared. And the monster came and was killed by a young man who just came from nowhere. And we let that young man marry the king's widow. And of course we discover as the play goes along that Oedipus, uh, the young man, has murdered his father and married his mother. And that's why there is a plague on the city. So, um, but in, in all the Greek tragedies, they'll begin with a chorus giving us that background information. The other type of exposition is called scattered exposition. Scattered exposition, we get throughout the play, we'll get it at the beginning, and then we'll get pieces as we go along. Sometimes you'll be re-reminded of something or something new will happen and we need some new information. Scattered exposition usually happens in dialogue. Two characters are talking, and from that, we get the information we need. Uh, I like murder mysteries a lot. A lot of times, uh, murder mysteries will begin with the butler and a maid, and they'll come out and go, oh, did you hear? The master has been to India. India? Oh, yes, India. Strange things happened while he was there. Really? Like what? Oh, Master has come back with a box. A box? Yes, a very mysterious box. I mean, and they'll go through and they'll give you all this information. Um, a lot of it, uh, again, is uh, we, when we talked about planting, it, information that will be planted that's needed later. But a lot of it is just to get information that we have to have to understand what is going on in a story. Very early in a play, after we've received the exposition, we reach what is called a crisis. And the first crisis in a play is called the precipitating act. The precipitating act is very important. It is a decision made by the protagonist. Now, the protagonist is the most important person in a play. It's the person we know the most about, and they drive the action of the play. The protagonist uh, makes a decision early in the play, and this decision sets the play in motion. The play now takes off. So we've been getting exposition, the protagonist makes a decision, and that decision sends off the play um, towards, uh, eventually, its conclusion. This decision, the precipitating act, um, in if we go back to the play Macbeth, and 
I like Shakespeare. Shakespeare names a lot of his plays after his protagonist. Uh, in Macbeth, the protagonist is Macbeth. Uh, in Hamlet, it is Hamlet. In Julius Caesar, it's Brutus. Um, he didn't do that in that play because Brutus, the name, wouldn't sell tickets. Everybody knew who Julius Caesar was. So even though he dies in like the second act of the play, the, he called the play Julius Caesar. But in almost all his other plays, the play is named after the protagonist. In Macbeth, the character Macbeth makes a decision very early in the play that sets the play in motion. And what he does is he decides to kill the king. Once he makes that decision and he kills the king, there's no turning back. That's the precipitating act. Now, the play will go on for a while. We'll get more exposition. But eventually, about halfway through a play, a second major crisis takes place. And this is called the major crisis. The major crisis is the second decision made by the protagonist that now drives the play towards its conclusion. Once that decision is made, there absolutely is no turning back. The protagonist must now move forward. The story is building in action. And if we go back to the play Macbeth, Macbeth kills the king, and then he makes a decision. Uh, he gets information. Uh, Macbeth, early in the play, uh, sees a vision of uh, a friend of his that he has killed. He gets this um, vision, unfortunately for him, at a party where all the great thanes have been invited. Uh, it's when he's being crowned king. Uh, Macbeth has killed the king. He's made it look like uh, the king's sons uh, have done this. The sons have fled. Uh, the most important son, Malcolm, has fled to England, and Macbeth is made king. He talks to the vision, basically starts telling him that he's sorry he killed him, uh, or had him killed, and uh, he starts to reveal a lot. The thanes hear this. His wife, Lady Macbeth, runs out, orders everybody out of the hall, and then she uh, screams at Macbeth for being weak. But one of the thanes who hears this information is the most powerful thane in the country. He's a character called Macduff. And Macduff um, begins to wonder if Macbeth um, is good or evil. He wonders if the king's son, Malcolm, is good or evil. Well, word gets back to Macbeth that Macduff is going to go to England to meet with Malcolm. Uh, he goes berserk over this. He, he does not want this to happen. And so he makes a decision and he sends murderers to the house of Macduff to kill him and all his family. They do this but they miss Macduff. Macduff has already gone to England when they get there. But they kill Macduff's wife, they kill all his children, all his servants, everyone. Once that decision has been made, there's no turning back for Macbeth. Because what happens in the story is Macduff really hasn't decided to join Malcolm. And Malcolm is in England raising an army. He's talking to Malcolm. He decides Malcolm is a young teenager. He's too weak to fight. And he's pretty much decided he's not going to join him. When a cousin of his named Ross shows up and tells him that the king, Macbeth, has killed all his family. 
Macduff goes berserk, as any father would do, as any husband would do, and he tells Malcolm he will join him, and all he asks is to be allowed to be the one to face Macbeth and to kill him. Therefore, the decision that Macbeth makes to kill Macduff, to kill his family, is the major crisis of the play. Not long after that, we usually see um, an event happen in a play. It's called a dark, bright scene. A dark, bright scene is a twist. And a twist is, uh, for a playwright, the playwright sets you up. They make you think something's going to happen, and then they change directions. It's a twist. The dark, bright scene in a tragedy like Macbeth is we believe everything's going to work out for the protagonist. And then the rug's going to be pulled out from underneath their feet and they're not going to get what they want. In the play Macbeth, Macbeth talks to the witches and the witches tell him two things. They say, no man born of woman can harm Macbeth. And Macbeth takes that as a great omen. No, no man born of woman. Well, he says, everyone's born of woman, so no one can harm me. And two, they tell him that not to fear until Burnham Wood moves on the castle. Um, Macbeth thinks about this, and trees don't move. So he's safe. Um, there's a scene where he's talking to a doctor. Uh, Macbeth's wife is not faring very well. She's feeling very guilty about the murder of the king, and she's going insane. He tells the doctor to keep an eye on her, um, and then they get word that she has committed suicide. This doesn't look well for Macbeth, but he He's hardened since he's committed murder. And he says, well, that's a bad thing, but at least Burnham Wood hasn't moved on me. Everything's going to be okay. Well, a guard comes up and says, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how to tell you this, but I was on watch and methinks, uh, Shakespearean, methinks I saw Burnham Wood move on the castle. Now, what has happened is this. The British soldiers and the thanes, the army that Malcolm has put together, have cut trees down, small trees, and they're holding them up in front of them as camouflage. And they're moving close to the castle before they charge, uh, trying to be stealthy. Um, and so it looks like Burnham Wood is moving on the castle. Well, Macbeth goes berserk. He threatens to kill the guard, but then he reminds himself, well, gee, Burnham Wood may be moving on me, but no one can harm Macbeth, born of woman, so everything's good. So he orders uh, his men to give him his armor, and he decides that even if everything in the country leaves him, he can defeat anyone because all people are born of woman. Well, that leads us to the final crisis of a play. The final crisis, the moment of highest action, it's called the climax. In the play Macbeth, Macbeth, uh, there's a battle scene. Macbeth kills a, a young soldier uh, and he hears someone yell from behind, turn, hellhound, turn, and he turns around and it's Macduff. And he and Macduff start to sword fight. And Macbeth stops the fight and he says to Macduff, he says, look, I've killed too many of your family. I don't want your blood on my hands too. Uh, this is fruitless. You, you can't defeat me because no one 
born of woman can harm me. And Macduff looks at him and says, I was from me mother's womb, untimely ripped. In other words, his mother had a C-section. He wasn't born, he was cut out. And Macbeth knows at that moment he is doomed. But being a tragic hero, he makes the decision to fight on. He's even given an option. Macduff tells him if he'll surrender, he won't kill him, but they'll put him in a wagon and show the people what a tyrant looks like. And Macbeth says, I will not bow down to Malcolm's feet, lay on Macduff, and they fight. This battle, this, this last decision to fight Macduff is the climax of the play. Of course, Macbeth is killed. His head is brought out on a spike, a, a pike. <laughs> um, and uh, there is a warning given to the audience. Now, at the end of every play, there's usually uh, a summation. Um, you saw this play, here's what it was about, or you saw this play and here's what eventually is going to happen. Uh, we call this the denouement. The denouement is just the summary at the end of a play. And uh, Macbeth has a very short and uh, very to the point denouement. Uh, the character Malcolm comes out, he delivers a speech to the thanes, and he basically invites them to come uh, see him crowned, and the play ends. He is the rightful ruler, all is good in the world. Now, one thing I have not talked about is the antagonist. The antagonist of a play is the person we know the second most about, and they try to keep the protagonist from getting whatever he or she wants. They are in the way. They, 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 they fight the protagonist all the way through the play. The protagonist for the play Macbeth is Malcolm. Now, you'd, most people would say, well, Malcolm is weak. He, he doesn't ever stand up to Macbeth. And that is true. Um, he's not able to because of his age. He's a young teenager. So what, Mac, what uh, Shakespeare does, and a lot of good uh, playwrights will do this, is they supply us a substitute antagonist, and that is Macduff. Macduff is the substitute antagonist for Malcolm. Malcolm is the antagonist because he has everything to gain by defeating Macbeth. Uh, this is done in film a lot. If you go back to the Star Wars uh, films, uh, the first three that were made, which are the last three in the series, uh, the ones uh, that have uh, Luke Skywalker. Um, if you start thinking about uh, who the protagonist and antagonist are in those stories, the protagonist is Luke Skywalker, and the antagonist is not Darth Vader. Uh, it's the Emperor. Darth Vader fights for the Emperor, so he is a substitute antagonist. They, uh, that pretty much covers dramatic structure. Um, whenever you read a play, whenever you act on a play, take it apart. All plays, whether they're comedies, dramas, uh, whether they are uh, uh, absurdist, whether they're realistic, musicals, they will be divided up in these sections. Uh, sometimes it's a little hard to find, but they're there. And it will help you as an actor because, as I said in the beginning, your character, the character you've created, will tie into that. Whatever that super objective of that play is, your actions will tie back in to that super objective. Well, that's all for today, and um, I'll see you again very soon.